if everyone uh, could take a moment to sign that if you haven't done so. And we'll get starting here, get started here in just a moment. Come on in, folks. Good morning. Welcome. There's a sign-in sheet making its way around the room. Feel free to sign in. And folks, welcome to the Town of Wappature Town Hall for Dutchess County Department of Emergency Response's Citizens Preparedness Training Program, which we have been conducting since 2015. Uh, this program has made its way around Dutchess County uh, from one corner to the other corner, everywhere from the city of Beacon all the way up to the town of Northeast Millerton. Anyone ever been to Millerton? Make sure you have a full tank of gas when you're heading up that way on the corner of Massachusetts and Connecticut, right? So uh, the object of the game here was to bring citizens preparedness training to the residents of Dutchess County in their own communities, right? Rather than having an event in Hyde Park at our office and inviting everyone to come, which we did, uh, we wanted to be sure to uh, come out to the communities and talk specifically about some of the things that you should be prepared for in your communities. So here in the town of Wappature, uh, I'm also a councilman, William Beal, Ward 1. I'm also the Dutchess County Emergency Management Coordinator. So I wanted to bring this thing home uh, to the town of Wappinger again. The last time we were here, we were across the street at the Wappinger Junior High School last year, I believe it was. Uh, and uh, we had a pretty packed house there as well. So wanted to bring it here to the town hall. Uh, our HVAC is still being uh, perfected. So luckily we had a warm day today because if we had a cold day today, <laughs> we would have had to uh, light some candles or something in here before this thing started. Uh, here from uh, the town of Wappinger this evening, uh, in addition to uh, myself, we have Councilman Chris Phillips who represents the third ward on the eastern side of the town. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Joseph Cavassini, who is our uh, town historian, uh, among other things here at the town hall. Uh, and he uh, is very active in uh, making sure the day-to-day -day, uh, things occur uh, around here. Um, setting up for this event was one of the things that uh, Joey was tasked with, so making sure we had enough chairs and everything like that, all the logistical aspects uh, he, uh, he handles. Also, Deputy Supervisor Kevin Haythorn is uh, present with us as well. Uh, Dr. Thurston, our town supervisor, was unable to attend but sends his regards and wanted to make sure that I mentioned uh, one of the events that occurred here in this town last year, uh, which was a significant uh, uh, impact event, and we will talk about that. So this program basically was born uh, out of uh, an initiative that Governor Cuomo put together in 2015 where the governor wanted to really ramp up preparedness efforts for the residents of New York State. And uh, by doing so, uh, there was an initiative for citizen preparedness created where uh, New York State would offer this training, the American Red Cross would offer this training, uh, and they have been actively doing so uh, throughout Dutchess County. Uh, but our county executive wanted to personalize this presentation for Dutchess County specifically, and uh, by going out to municipalities and talking to the residents, and that's why we are here this evening. We have uh, trained over 1,800 residents. Actually, it's over 2,000 residents now. I've stood before uh, doing this presentation. Uh, in addition to these uh, municipal presentations, we have uh, Medical Reserve Corps uh, individuals that are here. If you're from the MRC, raise your hand. We have a number of MRC folks here. Our Medical Reserve Corps is our largest group of volunteers in Dutchess County. Uh, the Medical Reserve Corps is about 50% medical folks and 50% non-medical folks that uh, basically make themselves available to assist during disasters and major emergencies. Now on blue sky days like today, they will be available to assist with training. They'll be available to assist with uh, what we call exercises, drills, and things like that. Uh, they've been utilized for a number of uh, real world events where we've had uh, outbreaks of uh, uh, measles in certain areas of the county at certain times where they have been utilized to uh, set up points of uh, 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 dispensing uh, medications and things like that. So um, I got to get the plug in for the MRC because uh, we're always looking for members to join the MRC. And it's one of those groups that uh, really you can uh, 
uh, choose the amount of time that you can, uh, can give. It's not one of those things where, like in my firehouse, where you have to do 25% of this, 25% of that, 20, or else you don't you, you know, stay active. The MRC, uh, under the direction of coordinator Jill Ryan, uh, takes the approach that there are folks that can give more time than others, and there are folks that can give less time than others. And he's done a great job balancing that group and keeping people motivated uh, and active. And you can see just the, tonight is a prime example. We have six members of the MRC here tonight. Uh, and every citizen's preparedness training since the beginning, we've had representatives from the MRC present uh, at each one of the trainings, and they're all volunteers, so we greatly appreciate uh, their hard work. The senior citizen picnics that happen throughout Dutchess County, we have one here in the town of Wappinger on Robinson Lane at the Robinson Lane Baseball Complex once a year. The MRC is present at that event, uh, as well as uh, all the other Dutchess County uh, uh, senior citizen picnics. So definitely a great resource, and I would encourage you to stop by their table uh, this evening after we conclude, pick up some information. A lot of what we're going to talk about this evening they have uh, in literature. So uh, don't feel like you have to write too much down here this evening. Uh, everything we're going to talk about is available on their literature, but it's also available on ready.gov. Ready.gov is the website uh, that FEMA has commissioned to include the information that we talk about here this evening. So uh, over 2,000 folks have been trained uh, in hazard vulnerabilities, which is something we'll talk about tonight. Uh, weather emergencies, sheltering in place, evacuation, making emergency plans, uh, building a kit. Uh, and for all of you in this room, uh, not the folks that are watching on television, only the folks that are in this room, you will all receive one of these kits this evening as long as you pass the 500 question multiple. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're, you're just going to receive one. And basically we call these starter kits, right? So these kits have a lot of the items we're going to talk about this evening, but there's a lot of room in here to add things. We're going to talk about what to add. So our citizen preparedness tour, like I said, has made it throughout Dutchess County. We've been to the town of Amenia, the city of Beacon, the town of Beekman, town of Dover, uh, town of Dover Wingdale Library. Libraries are a great resource for folks. Uh, I'm a firm believer of libraries in times of emergency being good locations for uh, individuals that may not have the means to find resources in any other way, uh, especially uh, during times of emergency. Uh, libraries also in Dutchess County serve as pre-designated cooling centers and pre-designated warming centers for folks that don't have the ability to get cool or get warm, right? There was a time years ago where they would open up cooling centers all over the place in Dutchess County and other counties. That was the practice, but we found out very quickly only one or two people would show up to these things. Uh, and generally, they were people that just didn't have the means to go anywhere else, right? So uh, rather than opening up shelters or cooling centers, or warming centers every single time we have an extreme temperature. We now have agreements with the libraries where they become resources. Uh, and it works out better, frankly, because uh, we were opening up town halls and village halls. Uh, generally, they close at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So what happens at the hottest time of the day, right, during August, when it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon and it's still 100 degrees outside, we can't really ask people to leave. So libraries generally are open until 8 or 9 o'clock at night, depending on the day of the week. And I have to say that uh, all the libraries in Dutchess County have really stepped up and uh, been a resource. And they're always looking to be a resource uh, for emergencies. And uh, we have a great partnership. So the Wingdale Library is one example of that. In the town of East Fishkill, uh, we uh, gave a presentation at their community center, the town of Fishkill Town Hall. We've been there a couple times. My office is at the Dutchess County Department of Emergency Response in the town of Hyde Park at the 911 Center. Uh, at that facility, we have a training room that we've offered this program in as well. But like I said before, uh, having folks from different parts of the county drive to Hyde Park is uh, inconvenient for, for most, so uh, that's why we come to you. We've also been to the town of Hyde Park Town Hall. Uh, as I mentioned, town of Northeast Village Millerton Library is actually the, the location. Uh, the way it works out in that municipality, the village of Millerton happens to sit right in the middle of the town in Northeast, and the library in that community is really the hub. And they have an annex building to their library, so it's the ideal for this type of training. The town of Pauling, we've been to the Pauling Fire Department and the Pauling Library, town of Pine Plains, town of Pleasant Valley Library. Uh, the city uh, and town of Poughkeepsie uh, area, we were at the Stabilization Center. We've also been to the Boardman Road Library. If you haven't been to that library, that's a, a very impressive facility. Um, and a big shout out to Tom Lawrence, uh, who uh, is the executive director, who has uh, been a great resource uh, for our organization. Uh, other locations we've uh, visited uh, as well, uh, the Town of Poughkeepsie Senior Center, the Town of Wappinger Senior Center, 
the town of Red Hook Town Hall, the town of Red Hook Community Center, Village of Rhinebeck, uh, town of Stanford, three times, and they're looking for a fourth time. Um, Village of Wappagers Falls, Dutchess Community College twice uh, as well. So my point here is uh, we've been to a lot of different locations. We've spoken to a lot of different people. We've gotten a lot of questions, uh, which feel free to ask questions as we go through this program. Uh, my background itself, uh, besides being a councilman here in the town of Wappinger, um, my, I got my start in the volunteer fire service. I uh, was one of the youngest fire chiefs in Dutchess County. Uh, back in 2001 and 2002, I was the chief of the Houstonville Fire Department, which covers this area right here. Uh, I've been in Houstonville since the age of 16. I was 24 when I was fire chief in 2001 and 2002. A lot of people get into emergency management from the volunteer fire service or uh, from other emergency service agencies. Uh, here in this town, we're served by three uh, fire departments outside the village of Wappagers Falls, Houstonville, New Hackensack, and Chelsea. Uh, the Village of Wappagers Falls uh, also uh, has its own fire department, but we all work together. In my capacity as councilman, uh, one of my tasks over the years has been to improve communication between the different agencies that work in this town. Uh, from our ambulance provider to our fire departments to our police agencies, this town doesn't have its own police department, right? Uh, many people ask me, why don't you have your own police department? Well, uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, genesis, really. This town decided many, many years ago that they wanted to partner with the sheriff's office rather than start a police department. And uh, many of the police departments that exist today started as partnerships with the sheriff's office. This town uh, continued that partnership, which we uh, continue today. And we're in the unique position where the state police uh, are located next to our town hall on our campus. So the state police actually pay us rent to be here in our town. And uh, for those of you that live in the town of Wappinger, you'll see a big difference on your tax bill as compared to neighboring towns that have police departments. We have a police department that pays us. Uh, and uh, we do uh, contract with the sheriff's office for certain specific patrols. So if you live in a neighborhood where you feel that you have an issue that needs direct attention, we have the ability to focus patrols on that neighborhood, and we do so. So <clears throat> we have that flexibility from, uh, from a town perspective. From a county perspective, my responsibility is overall coordination and communication within agencies uh, throughout Dutchess County. So, for example, uh, emergency management really has to do with major emergencies and disasters, right? Everyday situations are handled by the agencies that handle those situations, right? The everyday traffic accident is handled by police agencies, maybe a fire agency and an emergency medical service agency. Those happen every day, right? Um, House fires happen on a regular basis. Uh, we're not concerned from an emergency management standpoint on the singular incident. We're concerned about the large scale incidents that can impact uh, large areas of a town, multi-jurisdictional incidents, multi-agency types of responses. That's my responsibility from a county perspective. So I bring uh, my county background and my town background together on a number of uh, situations. One of them happened here in May of 2018. Does anyone know what happened here in May of 2018? It was May 15, 2018. There was a tornado in the city of Newburgh which tragically took the life of a child. That tornado came across the Hudson River and spread out into what's called a macroburst, okay? Uh, the macro burst impacted the Chelsea area uh, and parts of the town of Fishkill, uh, but primarily uh, parts of this town were affected uh, to the point where thankfully nobody lost their life, thankfully nobody was seriously injured, but there were a number of houses that were uninhabitable. Uh, we had a number of roadways that were impassable, power outages that lasted for days, uh, and this was really a, uh, a significant impact event that happened to uh, a two and a half square mile area. If you drive down 9D by Dutchess Stadium right now, you'll see trees that are still horizontal. That's, that's what happened. Um, you know, being in this business, uh, when those types of incidents happen, the National Weather Service is calling my cell phone, um, you know, five minutes later asking, is there twisting evident? Because they wanna be able to know if it was a tornado or if it was a straight line wind event. I will tell you, they would not classify it as a tornado, but down by the Hudson River, um, at Supervisor Thurston's house, as a matter of fact, uh, there were trees that were twisted. So I, I believe that this was a tornado that evolved into a macro burst as it came uh, on land. What just happened in Dallas the other night? Tornado. tornado. In Dallas. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys were playing, and the television station 
didn't break in with an emergency message. Why would they not do that? <laughs> That's how serious they take their football. Uh, the answer is they don't have to. They don't have to break in. It's a voluntary thing. Uh, they have since apologized for not breaking in. They did have one of those little um, tickers. tickers running across that said severe weather impacting, but uh, they did not break in until I think it was 16 minutes after the uh, impact. So my point in telling you that is we need to be prepared for ourselves, right? We can't depend on the radio, the television, uh, and other forms of media letting us know that something bad is going to happen. So one of the objectives here in this training is to help you better recognize when you need to be prepared. Okay, so we're going to talk about preparedness. What is preparedness? A continuous cycle of planning, organizing, training, equipping, exercising, evaluating, and taking corrective action in an effort to ensure effective coordination during an incident response. That's the FEMA boring definition, right? <laughs> in other words, planning ahead and taking measures to prepare for and reduce the effects of disasters, either natural or man-made. That's what we want to do. What is the objective with this training? This training is to build resiliency within communities, right? I want to come to you, to your community, provide you with the information and some of the tools to help you be better prepared so that you're not calling 911 immediately. Because what happens when something happens and someone needs help? They call 911. What happens when 1,000 people need 911 at the same time? They're all calling 911, okay? We have 24 trunk lines at the 911 center, so what's going to happen is if you don't get through initially, it's going to get bounced to the next 911 center, and then bounced to the next 911 center, and then bounced to the next 911 center. So if we can get out here and make a little dent in the community and help be people be better prepared for themselves and be a little more self-sustainable, then it'll be easier for the emergency services to prioritize who really needs help. Okay, So that's what we're doing here. And we're going to do this in a way uh, that is not entirely formal. So if you have a question while we're doing this, feel free to uh, raise your hand and we'll get your question answered as we go. So here's where we're going to ask you some questions. We, we've done this for quite a time now and uh, we go around the county and we ask people, how would you rate your current level of preparedness? How many folks in the room, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but how many folks in the room feel that they are well prepared for all emergencies? There's always a couple. That's fine. There are people that are well prepared. Uh, Dan, I didn't know you were a prepper. Okay, I, I saw those doors in the backyard. I mean, you know, he's got the bomb shelter and all. There are some people that do that. Not Dan. Just, just kidding, Dan. But uh, there are folks that come to my trainings uh, who clearly I know when they walk in the room that they are prepared. It's usually the individual wearing complete camouflage, wearing the backpack, walking in. Uh, it almost triggers my see something, say something uh, uh, mechanism, but usually that's the person. There's a prepper, right? Remember the show, that prepper show that used to be on years ago? Uh, and before I was in this job, I used to watch it and say, man, these people are crazy. Now I'm in this job and I say, hold on, maybe they're the smart ones, right? But there are limitations. There are people that are well prepared for emergencies, and that's a good thing. How about this? I have thought about preparing for emergencies and have gathered some supplies. There you go. Most people have thought about it from time to time, right? Gathered some supplies from time to time. That's fine. How about this? I know that it's important to prepare for emergencies, but I have not done so. You don't have to answer. Oh, and there's people, me, me. We're gonna, you don't have to identify yourself. Uh, it is important to prepare for emergencies, but let's face it, folks. We live in New York State, the most expensive state in the world, right? Uh, people are working two or three jobs. We do our best to keep your taxes as low as possible in the town of Wappinger, but we don't control school taxes. Just going to say. <laughs> we do the best we can. But people are concerned about the day, right? Me too. I got to get through this day, right? Get up early in the morning. I just got to get to the end of the day. You're not thinking about what could happen during that day. And there's a lot of things that could happen during that day. And we hope that uh, you'll take away some of this information this evening. I do not know how to prepare for a disaster or emergency and have no plans in place. You don't have to identify yourself, but there are people that don't know where to start, right? We specifically take this program out into low-income urban areas as well, right? People that may not have means, 
Uh, I'm going to be doing a Hudson River housing location uh, coming up uh, in November. And I specifically want to go to those types of places too, where I can bring the kit and give it out to everybody there um, and make sure that they have some means, right? Because those people that are uh, going through a tough time in life are worried about survival day to day, right? They're not necessarily worried about uh, a disaster. I want to make sure we're, we're helping them. So we do that as well. Why are people not prepared? Well, some people say, I don't think anything is likely to happen. Well, if you've been watching the news any time in the last three years, you'll, you will have seen, especially since 2017, you're going to see unprecedented weather events, right? We don't get into the politics of weather in this program. We leave it to the scientists. But what I can tell you is this. We, as emergency managers, are seeing trends that we have never seen before. We are seeing, what we saw in Dallas was the most expensive catastrophic tornado impact in history. And it's only been how many days? They already know that it's gonna exceed that number. They already know. And you know, let's face it, not every one of these tragedies gets the media coverage it deserves, okay? In 2017, we had three hurricanes that hit. There was coverage uh, nonstop about the hurricanes, right? There wasn't any coverage really about the wildfires that were going on also. And then after the wildfires, what happened in California after the wildfires? The landslides, right? You're talking catastrophic disaster, uh, unprecedented. Didn't get a lot of coverage um, as compared to the hurricanes. So if you don't think anything is likely to happen, you need to be better informed. Just the fact that you are sitting in this room, your resiliency is better than most, right? One of the reasons why we're putting this on the TV channel and putting it on YouTube is so that folks that couldn't be here tonight uh, can watch this. It's not going to be as entertaining on uh, YouTube, but, uh, and you're not going to get a kit, so you have to come to one of my trainings. Because <laughs> you know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. You're going to contact Town Hall, and you're going to say, can I get a kit? No, you can't. You have to attend the training. I've done this before. Uh, there are folks out there that can't afford the supplies right now, right? If you're worried about putting food on the table, you're not necessarily worried about putting food into a kit. We understand that. That's why we're going to help you with a starter kit. I don't like to think about disasters. Nobody likes to think about disasters, but I can tell you that every single uh, news network over the last couple of years especially has featured a disaster every other day in some way, shape, or form. There's different types of disasters. They don't have to be natural disasters. We are going through an epidemic of active shooters right now that is beyond disturbing, okay? Uh, we don't get into uh, active shooters specifically in this program, but I will tell you, Dutchess County offers an active shooter preparedness program that we would be happy to bring here to the town hall. It is conducted by the Dutchess County Sheriff's Office, and it basically talks about run, hide, fight, okay? Uh, so the only active shooter background we'll give you in this uh, particular presentation is run, hide, fight. You can Google that and learn about what that means. Basically, statistically, that's how you're going to survive, okay? Uh, we don't like to think about that, but it could happen, and it's also considered a disaster. I have no time to plan. I have no time to plan, and it's my career. We have to make time to plan, right? We have plans at Dutchess County for everything. We have plans here at the town for emergencies as well. We have plans in the fire department as well. But you have to blow the dust off those plans every five years or so and take a look at them and revise them, okay? The same thing is true for your own plan, we'll talk about. I know help will come when I need it. Help will come when you need it on a blue sky day. If you call 911 right now, we have the fastest emergency medical services response times in Dutchess County. I will put that to a test. Well, if you call from here, you're gonna get them even quicker. But the point is, <laughs> assuming, they're, assuming they're there. Uh, but we, uh, as a town, we focus on these types of things. We have an ambulance contract. Not every town has an ambulance contract, believe it or not. There's an EMS crisis, not only in Dutchess County, but in this country. On NBC Network News the other night, it talked about how 30% of the volunteer ambulance corps in the United States will be out of business in the next five years, all right? We don't have a volunteer ambulance corps here. We have professional paramedics and EMTs uh, who are on call for this town with advanced life support ready to go. Now, that's on a blue sky day. There are times where there could be a plane crash in the town, right? where we have a situation where all of our units are gonna be needed, right? 
or we could have a disaster where all of our units are going to be consumed, right? We want you to understand that most of the time you're going to get the help you need, but there are times where it may be delayed, and we want you to be able to help yourself, okay? So this evening we're going to talk about understanding the risks, we're going to talk about making a plan, we're going to talk about building a kit, we're going to talk about how to stay informed, how can we communicate with you, right? Uh, and then you're going to receive a kit, as long as you stay wide awake until the end, right? <laughs> Wake up back there. <laughs> Understanding the risks. So here in Dutchess County, we're going to talk about the types of hazards in our community and how to respond to them. We're going to be aware of any warning and notification systems available to you. This is important, right? In this uh, day and age of uh, advanced communications and technology, how can we talk to you? How can you talk to us? We'll get into that in a few minutes. Dutchess County is a county of nearly 300,000 residents, not including those who work or attend college in the county. One third of the county's population is concentrated in the southwest quadrant. Where are we right now? In the southwest quadrant. Most of the population is on the west side of the county, but the fact that we have one third of the county's population concentrated in the southwest quadrant, why is that something that we need to know when we plan for emergencies? The more densely populated areas of the county could be more challenging if we have to relocate people or evacuate people, right? So folks need to understand that there are back roads that exist. So if you need to get out of here, uh, 9D might not be the best route, right? Uh, 52 might not be the best route. Uh, Route 9 can be sometimes pretty uh, backed up. But the folks that live in this area know how to get around from point A to point B, right? Uh, because if we have to move people, which is unlikely, but if there's some reason why we have to relocate people, uh, it's, it's good to know different options. We're a combination of urban and rural communities here, right? What is the town of Wappature considered? An urban or rural community? Yes. So, depending on how you define it, right, we are actually considered more of a suburban type area, right? Uh, if you look at Dutchess County as a whole, the agricultural areas in Dutchess County where the density uh, is different than here, where you have you know, farmland, open space all over the place, those are the more rural communities. Here in the town of Wappinger, yes, we do have agriculture, but we also have two-thirds of the village of Wappinger's Falls. The village of Wappinger's Falls is the second most densely populated municipality in Dutchess County behind the city of Poughkeepsie. There's five to 6,000 people in 1.2 square miles, okay? So that's a lot of people uh, in a small area, and that's a portion of our town. So we need to be aware of that. Uh, we plan with the, town, with the village of Wappinger's Falls. Uh, there is one potential major hazard in the village of Wappinger's Falls that we have plans in place for. Anyone want to guess what it is? <coughs> what holds back the water from the Wappinger's Falls. There's a really old dam, and that really old dam is a, considered a high hazard dam, okay? One of the things my office deals with uh, are dam emergency operation plans, right? Every dam that is medium hazard or high hazard is required to have an emergency operations plan on file with the state Department of Environmental Conservation, DEC, right? And they send a copy to my office. What I do is, when it comes to my office, I look at the emergency action notification plan where if someone sees the dam failing, I make sure it says call 911, not call the owner of the dam, right? Because that's what a lot of them said. And calling the owner of the dam is not the right thing to do if you have a high hazard dam that's failing. About two months ago, I got a call from the town of Unionvale and uh, the supervisor said, Funny thing, uh, our pond is empty. I said, what? Our pond is empty. I said, has it ever been empty before? Nope. I said, well, where's the dam? Uh, the dam is downstream. Has anyone looked at the dam? No. <laughs> so our concern was what's downstream of that dam, and luckily there were no residential dwellings or anything like that, um, but uh, we went there, we immediately went out there, and the dam actually has been there for, I don't know, 100 years, and uh, the water undermined it just slowly on the overnight and emptied out the whole pond. So uh, it ended up being a privately owned dam. I had to track down the property owner and uh, make sure that they had uh, been notified and that they had plans in place, but um, luckily there was no uh, catastrophic damage or failure or anything like that. I mean, it happened in the middle of the night. Imagine, imagine you live in, you know, alongside this uh, creek that never gets above six inches and all of a sudden 
you know, here it comes. What was interesting, about a week later, I got a call from the neighboring town supervisor. The town of Beekman supervisor called and said, hey, um, we're wondering when that dam's going to be fixed because our swimming area is now filled with silt. So I said, here's the number to the DEC. <laughs> because the silt that came down from that pond ended up in their swimming area, and now they couldn't use their swimming area uh, in the town of Beekman. So luckily, it was just inconveniences. It wasn't anything major, but it's a reminder that we need to keep an eye on these things. We have a number of high hazard dams here in Dutchess County that if they were to fail, uh, there could be uh, life loss. Uh, one of those is the Wappagers Falls Dam. And I just received uh, correspondence today from the state DEC uh, relative to an inspection that occurred there. And, you know, there's always a number of things on the checklist that need to be reviewed, but it's intact, which is a good thing. Uh, so we keep an eye on our dams. That's, uh, there are many of them throughout Dutchess County. I think there's 85 of them, believe it or not. Dutchess County borders along the Hudson River and has numerous watersheds prone to flooding, including the Wappagers Creek, Fishgill Creek, and 10 Mile watersheds. Limited north to south, east to west transportation corridors outside the major thoroughfares, and that just goes right along with how to, how to evacuate the area. Uh, what's interesting is if you drive around southern Dutchess County, you'll see signs that say emergency evacuation route A and emergency evacuation route B. Now, I've been in this job for almost six years, and after about a year on the job, I said to myself, I better find out what these are because they're not in any of my plans. What do you think they are? They are emergency evacuation routes for Indian Point from Westchester and Putnam County that come up on the west side of Dutchess County across Route 52 and 84 down to Brewster to the reception center that they're required to have for those that are in the 10 mile zone of Indian Point. We're not in the 10 mile zone, we're in the 50 mile zone and we'll talk a little more about that difference in a few, but they are actually evacuating people potentially through Dutchess County. You think that we should know about that, right? Yeah. We do now. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you'll see those signs, that's what they are. They have to do with the uh, Indian Point plant. Now the good news is Indian Point is gonna be decommissioned in 2021, I believe. The bad news is it takes 50 years for the uranium to actually uh, be totally uh, dead. So we'll talk a little more about that in a few. Also in Dutchess County, two passenger rail lines plus Amtrak. We have the Hudson line over on this side, right? And the Harlem line on the other side. Why is that important for us relative to uh, emergency planning? A lot of people are traveling on those rails, right? Uh, if we were to have a spite and dival type incident uh, like occurred a few years back, uh, we have pre-deployed mass casualty incident trailers in Dutchess County that would get to a scene like that and be able to assist uh, very quickly. We know how many people are on the trains, you know, give or take uh, throughout the peak time periods. We know how many cars are on the train. Uh, so we have plans in place uh, in case there's an issue on the rails. Now, commuters are one challenge. What happens on the overnight on the Hudson Line? In addition to Amtrak's coming through, we have freight trains, believe it or not. And all that buzz a few years ago about Bakken crude oil, everybody was getting all worked up about Bakken crude. We don't have that in Dutchess County. We have it on the other side of the river, so it is still a concern. Bakken crude oil is more of a volatile crude oil that if it falls over the, off the tracks, it can get into the Hudson River, it can become a real environmental hazard. But coming up and down our tracks, we have things that are even uh, more volatile, chlorine, things like that. We have plans in place uh, in case there is an incident uh, involving hazardous materials on the rails. Dutchess County has a hazardous materials response division uh, that is continuously training. Uh, I have Metro North and Amtrak on speed dial. They call me before uh, anything uh, uh, usually happens uh, when there's an issue on the tracks. But we have to keep in mind there's a lot of movement going on through the town of Wappinger, okay? Uh, we have that rail running through the town of Wappinger. So um, a lot of times it's out of sight, out of mind in the town of Wappinger, but Chelsea is a uh, accurate crossing uh, and things can happen. We have a county airport in the town of Wappinger, right? Hudson Valley Regional Airport, it's getting busier. Have you noticed? They built a hangar, they're building a hangar for Dutchess Community College. They have one of the old Air Force Ones out there now that they're using for uh, uh, training. Um, the county executive's initiative is to better utilize the airport since it uh, was not a revenue generator. We're trying to generate revenue uh, with that airport and I believe we're being successful. But with an airport comes certain types of hazards, right? Uh, so we have, you know, see something, say something all around that airport. We have uh, uh, the sheriff's office has a substation at the airport. Uh, we just had a plane crash off Maloney Road. 
which was uh, luckily nobody was killed in that plane crash. Um, Multi-agency uh, response to that. Uh, we just recognized many of the folks that responded to that as first responders at our award ceremony, uh, saving the lives of those individuals that uh, were in that plane that ran out of fuel short of the runway uh, and came down. Uh, not far from here, there's a, uh, uh, in the town of Unionville, Sky Acres Airport, which is basically just an airstrip. They just had a plane crash too into a house where tragically uh, an occupant in the home was killed. Uh, and the pilot of the plane was killed, and uh, just as tragically, one of the residents of the home was seriously burned uh, and uh, is fighting for her life. So we prepare for these types of things. Um, I was on the scene of that incident um, as a coordinator on scene assisting with the agencies at the plane crash in the town of Wappinger. I was on the floor of the 911 center standing behind the call taker that was on the phone with the female that was involved in the plane crash. So. We have uh, plans in place for these types of incidents. Large electrical substations, telecommunications switching station, Iroquois pipeline, also in Dutchess County. New York City's aqueducts. Where's New York City's aqueduct? Well, there's one in Croton, but there's one in the town of Wappinger. <laughs> Chelsea, substation, right? Shaft number six, I believe it is. Now, do you know that 51% of New York City's daily drinking water goes under the town of Wappinger? 51%, okay? What is the number one hazard to that aqueduct? The number one threat or hazard? Earthquake. That is a hazard, but it's not number one. Terrorism is number one. That's why they have their own police department. You'll see the New York City DEP police driving around. They have their own hazardous <laughs> materials division that drives around. Uh, the security to get anywhere near that shaft is uh, very uh, heightened for good reason. Now, we're in the middle of a major construction project right now building a bypass tunnel underneath the Hudson River, 800 feet down, uh, to improve that aqueduct. When I say we, I should say New York City is. We, as a town, um, have a contract in place with New York City whereby they provided us with $11 million in water infrastructure because the irony here is, there's a couple ironies. The first thing is, half of New York City's drinking water is going under Chelsea, which doesn't have municipal water, right? Think about that. Nobody in Chelsea has municipal water, but half of New York City's drinking water is going underneath. Now, back in the 1930s, there was an opportunity for Dutchess County to sign uh, a contract with New York City to provide water to our residents, but part of the stipulation was we'd have to build reservoirs all over the place like Putnam County and other counties, right? Dutchess County back then, I think it was 1938, decided that wasn't gonna be an option. So because of that, uh, uh, the town of Wapmanger did not have access to that water. Under a new uh, agreement uh, where they were gonna start this project a number of years ago, Dutchess, or I should say New York City needed water to do the project. They needed water from a separate source to do the project. So we were able to strike a deal with them uh, to run water from Old Hopewell Road and Route 9 all the way down Old Hopewell Road, New Hamburg Road, Wheeler Hill Road, through Carnwath uh, Farms, out to uh, the shaft off of River Road. That was all paid for by New York City, all that water infrastructure. After 2021, once the project is done, that becomes accessible to our town residents. Uh, the only exception is Tall Trees has access to that water right now because they were in a water emergency prior to the project beginning. So the residents of Tall Trees are utilizing water in that pipe. So New York City's aqueduct coming under the town of Wappinger is definitely something that we have plans for as well. Dutchess County hosts many mass gathering events throughout the year, including the Dutchess County Fair. You're talking four to 500,000 people at the Dutchess County Fair over a six day period. You could have 40,000 people on the property at once. What is the number one threat to the Dutchess County Fair? Yeah. Terrorism is a threat, but it's not number one. Weather. The number one threat to a county fair is weather. No notice weather event, which is exactly what that macro burst was. It was a tornado in Newburgh, very quickly came across the Hudson River and became a macro burst here. We are constantly monitoring weather throughout the Dutchess County Fair, right? Uh, the National Weather Service is basically monitoring uh, a given area and if something is approaching the Dutchess County Fair, they're gonna call the command post. 
They monitor weather on site at the command post and two other locations. Where do you think they're monitoring weather at the Dutchess County Fair? At the stage, we've all seen those videos on YouTube where tragically the stage uh, is affected by a wind event, right? So the staging company that we have at the Dutchess County Fair is the same staging company that does New Year's Eve in Times Square. They are no joke. They are monitoring weather. Uh, and if there's wind gusts over 30 miles per hour, the speakers come down, the stage comes, everything is uh, lowered uh, via lifts so that uh, it's not up in the air. Uh, the area around the stage is evacuated. And last, uh, this last fair, they actually had to cancel one of the, the shows because of a, uh, uh, an incoming weather event. We're not taking a chance. The other location that we uh, monitor weather actively at the Dutchess County Fair is where? Who said rides? At the Midway. Why at the Midway? We have the largest Ferris wheel on wheels uh, in the United States at that location. So wind gusts obviously uh, can be a real hazard. And plus, we don't want people on a Ferris wheel and if there's any threat of lightning, right? One of those rides actually uh, uh, had, a, had a mechanical failure this year. Uh, and it, you know, they prepare for the Ferris wheel every year, right? They have a ladder truck from the fire department come in, make sure they can reach the highest point, right? So of course, Murphy's Law, the ride next to it, which was slightly higher than the Ferris wheel, failed. And it was one of those ones where you strap in, right? And you're in a little thing and it turns you upside down when it goes to the top. So here are these people upside down, you know, for 45 minutes until they could get the hydraulics to release and it came down nice and slow. Um, but, uh, Scary, right? <laughs> Scary. I don't know if they took selfies. I don't, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so there's all sorts of plans in place on a fair of that size. Uh, but there's other events in Dutchess County that attract a lot of people as well, right? We have a marathon here in Dutchess County. It's now called the Dutchess County Classic Marathon. Why would we do planning for a marathon? Why would we, why would we put a lot of effort into planning for a marathon? What happened in Boston a few years ago, right? The marathon that occurs in Dutchess County is a Boston Marathon uh, qualifier. So we don't take any chances. Uh, just like the Dutchess County Fair, things, there are things in place at these events that you may not recognize as precautionary. When you walk into the Dutchess County Fair in the new entranceway or on the Mulberry Street entrance, there's huge, these big planters with beautiful plants in them and trees. Those aren't really there as planters. They're filled with cement on the bottom so that some crazy person doesn't drive their car through the gate, okay? If you drive down Mulberry Street, you see these big concrete blocks that are, that are staggered every X number of feet. Those are not just there for looks. They have to fortify these entrances now in 2019. So they've taken precaution. Part of the marathon is occurring on the rail trail, right? Every entrance to the rail trail has a police officer during this marathon, okay? Uh, God forbid a vehicle gets on that rail trail. <coughs> so we uh, take great precaution in planning for these types of events. And also, there are canines that are trained to uh, sniff out explosives that are uh, run each day before the Dutchess County Fair around all the garbage cans and everything like that. So they do that at the uh, marathon as well. We host other mass gathering events here. There's one that occurs in Stormville. What's it called? <coughs> the Stormville Flea Market. Usually, the Stormville Flea Market will generate 5,000 people during one day, right? Beginning of the day to the end of the day, 5,000 people. Any event that generates over 5,000 people is considered a mass gathering, which means they have to file paperwork with the state and the county, have an ambulance on site. There's certain precautions that need to occur. Now, 5,000 people beginning of the day to the end of the day, that's doable at Stormville. How many people here have seen uh, Flea Market Flip? My wife forces me to watch these shows. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I think tonight is the night when the uh, Hallmark uh, Christmas movies begin, right? Oh, is it tomorrow? Oh, great. I, I was hoping I was missing. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you. My wife watches Hallmark Christmas movies year round. And I mean, I do watch a couple, but it's kind of the same plot, right? It's always the guy that, from out of town that comes in, right? It's always the same plot, right? But anyway, so I was kind of hoping I was missing that tonight, but I guess it's tomorrow. Uh, but... <laughs> Flea Market Flip, the host of Flea Market Flip is Lara, what's her name, from uh, Good Morning America. I forgot her last name, but uh, Lara Spencer, right? So uh, she went on Twitter and tweeted out that uh, they were going to be filming the season premiere. This is a couple years ago. We're going to be filming the season premiere for Flea Market Flip at Stormville Flea Market. What do you think happened? 
the 5,000 people that come from the whole, you know, beginning of the day to the end of the day all came at the beginning of the day. So, you know, I was home, you know, off, getting a call from the East Fishkill police chief. How do I access the signs over the interstate? You know, those big signs. I said, what's going on, chief? There's a people here at the Stormville. It's backed up all the way down, 216. Taconic's backed up, 84, you know, everything. We got to get, we got to tell people that the lots are closed. So I uh, said, okay, so... Those signs are all controlled at the uh, traffic management center in Hawthorne, so we were able to get the signs, you know, updated to say, uh, hey, uh, you know, the lots are closed at the Stormville flea market, come back later, you know, <laughs> but the people still came. My point is, that's the power of social media, right? The power of social media now uh, can, can really change the dynamic of a mass gathering, so we need to be prepared for those types of things. And what can you do when you're at a mass gathering, right? What can you do? When uh, my wife and I went and saw Hamilton on... Uh, Fourth of July weekend, right? I was a little nervous about that, right? We're at Hamilton. It's a, it's a popular show. It's Fourth of July weekend, and my wife's a police officer, so we're always thinking like, okay, let's, let's be prepared here. We wanna, this is what you want to do. You want to identify an exit in a venue like that. That's not the one you came in, okay? So if you're sitting on the mezzanine or you're sitting on the orchestra level, you're going to look and find an exit that's not the one you came in. Why is that? Most people are going to naturally go for the exit they came in. Uh, tragically, during the Rhode Island nightclub fire, that's what the studies have shown. Everyone tried to run out the same door that they came in. 99 people lost their lives that day. It was very tragic. There were four other exits. You know? So you should always keep an eye on a different uh, exit and be aware of that and be prepared. <coughs> At a mass gathering event, you always want to make sure that you have your eyes open and you're seeing what's going on around you. It's important for you to recognize any suspicious behavior and stay away from that area. So, <coughs> let's talk about natural or weather-related disasters that have occurred in Dutchess County. Flooding has occurred, excessive heat, ex extreme cold, public health emergencies. What's an example of some public health emergencies that could occur? The measles. Measles, measles right? Last year, we went through a very interesting time in this state and this country, I think, where the outbreak uh, of measles, it didn't affect Dutchess County, but it was affecting uh, Rockland County pretty seriously. There were a few cases in Orange County. Uh, these are things that are occurring. Why? Why were those outbreaks occurring? Non-vaxxers, right? They weren't vaccinating. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, they weren't vaccinating. We need to be aware that uh, that type of thing can occur if we don't vaccinate, right? Uh, anybody remember Ebola? Ebola was something that did affect Dutchess County very slightly. Uh, I believe we had one or two patients that uh, had returned from a third world country and were monitored. Nobody died as far as I know. Zika, Zika, the mosquitoes. Uh, in Dutchess County, we have a very proactive uh, health department that uh, has uh, epidemiologists that are monitoring data to indicate if there is anything like this going on. They monitor data from the hospitals, nursing homes, even 911 call data. If we get you know, 10 calls in a certain area for the same symptoms, that's a red flag. Something could be happening, right? So public health is something we take very seriously. Thunderstorms, winter storms, tornadoes. Do tornadoes occur in Dutchess County? Yes. Usually the tornado occurs in Red Oaks Mill. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know why. So about three years ago on Maloney Road, right? This was, this was crazy. Where do you hear this? Right, by Village Crest, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. We were in a meeting, a few of us that were in here were in a meeting. Uh, phones go off, tornado warning, right? If your phone goes off and says tornado warning, you need to pay attention to that. That is a different platform. That is an emergency alert system platform that is notifying you based on your location, all right? So, uh, tornado warning, seek shelter now. What are you going to do? Seek shelter now. Some people called 911 and said, what does seek shelter now mean? That's why we're here. That's why we're here, folks. Seek shelter, okay? It doesn't mean go outside with your phone and take a video of it, which is what someone did on Maloney Road, all right? The coincidence here is the fact that this tornado struck. Luckily, nobody was killed. It actually touched down on Maloney Road. There was somebody on Robinson Lane, believe it or not, that was filming that we have a, a video of. But crazier than that, there was a person on Maloney Road that saw this thing coming and started filming, okay? 
uh, filmed the entire thing, including the shed being ripped apart in their front yard, did not get injured, and then posted it up on YouTube, all right? National Weather Service calls me. Have you seen this video? And the national, let me just say, shout out to Steve, who is the chief meteorologist for this area. They get very excited when they see weather events going on. Did you see this video yet? I'm like, no, Steve, what? What video? The one in the Tattle Aperture, Maloney Road. I'll send you the link right now. So he sends it to me, and uh, I said, I'm heading out that way anyway. Oh, okay, yeah, wow. He goes, well, I guess we can confirm this one quick. So they, <laughs> normally they have to send them out to come, they come out to the area to confirm it. In this case, they didn't have to. And coincidentally, the next day was the big National Weather Service meeting that we have once a year in Albany, where usually the uh, meteorologists will take their favorite uh, pictures and videos and play them. So of course they used this one and they were, you know, they said, we were able to confirm this uh, tornado in Dutchess County, you know, within 15 minutes. And I said, Steve, calm down. We don't want to encourage people to take videos of this stuff. That's not what we want to do. So uh, that person did that. So don't do that. Don't stand outside and don't, you know, don't try to get that video because it's not worth getting hurt. Okay. Luckily nobody got hurt there. But that video did play over and over on all the New York City news stations and a weather channel. Uh, it was pretty impressive. Other types of disasters that could occur, power outages, right? Nobody here has ever had a power outage, right? <laughs> power outages happen regularly, right? The Public Safety Commission has really, uh, uh, I should say Public Service Commission has really, really, really been um, strict with our utility companies. Uh, they want the power back up as quick as possible, right? We have a great relationship with Central Hudson. I have a meeting with them on November 6th. Uh, our annual meeting with uh, Central Hudson is that day. We meet with NYSEG, which is the other side of the county. Um, we have them on speed dial. Uh, it becomes a challenge when there's a widespread power outage and you live at the last house on the last road in the town. That's where it becomes an issue because they're gonna put the people, uh, the, you know, the most people on first, right? So you should know that if you have Central Hudson, which you all should have Central Hudson, right? You can go to stormcentral.senhud.com. You can see the map, right? On that map, it'll tell you how many people are out of power, but it'll also give you an estimated time of restoration. My pet peeve is don't put an estimated time of restoration up. That's not accurate. Let's not guess. We had an issue last year, I think it was, uh, where folks in, uh, it was in the NYSEG area, folks had, uh, uh, you know, evacuated their home and stayed with family, and then they saw the estimated time of restoration tomorrow at 2 o'clock. They packed up their kids and their family and went back to their house, and there was no power for another eight hours. Don't do that. That's our, that's our, our gripe uh, with the uh, Public Service Commission. Don't put up false ETRs. Uh, and I don't think they do it on purpose, but we need to be a little more, uh, a little more accurate on the estimated time of restoration because power outages uh, can really be life-threatening for what group of people? Vulnerable populations, people that may be on a respirator, people that may be depending on the power for, uh, you know, even if it's a, if it's a uh, you know, a cold day or a hot day, there's some folks that really need to have climate control. Um, the quicker we get the power back on, uh, the less issues we have, right? Communication outages. That could be a crisis, right, nowadays. Everybody's on their cell phone. They have no data. What are they going to do? <laughs> well, here's my concern. Who here still has a landline in their house? Really? Okay, hold on. How many of you people have uh, a cable phone? It's like the triple play. How many people? Most of you do. Yeah, okay, all right. All right, all right. So back in the day when we had landlines that were only phone lines, right, it had its own power, uh, and uh, it basically was self-sufficient. You may have lose power, but you still have your, your landline, hard line, landline, right? Copper. Now, everybody's got the triple play. <clears throat> if you still have cable, you have the triple play. That's riding on your cable, right? So if your cable goes down, you don't have a phone. If your cell sites go down, you don't have a cell phone, right? How do you call 911? That's a problem. The, the Public Service Commission does not hold the cable companies uh, to the same standard as the utility electric companies. So you could have no cable, like this happened on River Road after that macro burst for like a week and a half. People didn't have phone service. And the cell sites, we lost 11 cell sites during that macro burst. And it, not every cell site has a generator. How about that? Not every cell site has a generator. So my position is they all should have generators because believe it or not, most of the 911 calls we take are from cell phones. 80% now are cell phones. And how's that going to work if you don't have a cell site that's working after a disaster 
Or how's that going to work if you live in another part of Dutchess County, like off of 9G, Northern Hyde Park, Rhinebeck? There's no cell service. How's that going to work? So, you know, we are lobbying as best as we can to uh, try to have as many cell sites in Dutchess County, but at the same time, put generators on those cell sites so if we have a disaster, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to still work. Transportation outages is something also that can affect us here in Dutchess County. Nuclear power instance we mentioned before relative to Indian Point. Uh, the Indian Point situation is changing, as I mentioned before. In 2021, I believe it is, they're supposed to be decommissioning Indian Point. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that the hazard is over, okay? And the real hazard for those that are around Indian Point is the unlikely catastrophic failure of Indian Point, which would be a, uh, a release of Indian Point. Now, for Dutchess County, we are not in the 10-mile zone. We are in the 50-mile zone, which means that the threat to Dutchess County would be what they call an ingestion pathway threat. An ingestion pathway threat means that meteorologists have determined that in the unlikely event of a catastrophic failure at Indian Point, everything will go up in the air and could be affected by weather and come up over Dutchess County and land on our agricultural assets and water supplies. So the Cornell Cooperative Extension, our agriculture partners, farms, there are plans in place uh, to uh, uh, try to prevent impact or minimize impact if that were ever to occur. That's what we plan for in Dutchess County. Is that enough? I don't think it's enough. Uh, we have federal funding we're putting towards additional uh, planning for nuclear incidents because um, there are other types of uh, nuclear issues that could occur here. Um, <coughs> You know, terrorism is always on our minds, and uh, if there was uh, ever to be a device uh, in this county or uh, uh, some level of threat like that, we need to have more rigorous plans, which we're working on uh, for uh, areas of Dutchess County. But Indian Point as a whole, uh, we do have regular communication. Anything that happens at Indian Point, we are notified immediately, uh, and we are uh, prepared to, uh, to deal with that. <coughs> Hazardous materials, always an issue. Terrorism, what are civil issues? I need more people to talk so I can drink. <laughs> 2016 was a crazy year in Dutchess County. Actually, it was a crazy year in this country. Here in Dutchess County, we had the unique opportunity to host two presidential candidates within 10 days, right? So we had Bernie Sanders at Marist College. Um, from a planning process, uh, as the emergency manager of the county, uh, my responsibility was to coordinate agencies and to assist the Secret Service uh, in any way we could, right? So we worked with the Secret Service. We set it up, nice perimeter, Marist College. Everything was great. Bernie Sanders' crowd was kind of laid back crowd, no big deal, right? Um, really didn't have any issues. Uh, we had a protest corral set up for people that wanted to protest. You guys can protest right over there. The line to get into the event is over there. Nobody's crossing paths. All good and everything was good, right? Ten days later, Donald Trump in the middle of the city of Poughkeepsie. <laughs> Same Secret Service detail, which was good. We just worked with them. Um, we utilized the same plan, basically, except we created a perimeter with the city of Poughkeepsie police around city blocks, right? People coming into the event will be on Main Street side. People that are going to be protesting the event will be on the arterial side. Everyone has their own place, right? The protesters were told, you have, you're welcome to be here. You have a whole area to be in, right? And it was a big area. Folks that were standing online for hours and hours that had their own, uh, you know, signs and uh, campaign signs, whatever, you could do whatever you want to do as long as you stay in line. You just can't have signs on sticks, right? Um, and there were some rules in place. No problem. Not one arrest. Not one issue. Protesters got a little crazy, but that was fine because they had their own spot to do that. Uh, we had plainclothes law enforcement mixed in with everybody, just, you know, just keep an eye on things. But we had no problem at either event. And the reason why we had no problem is because we planned ahead on these events using multiple agencies, communicating with each other. Nobody's trying to step on anybody's toes, and it all worked out. So civil issues can be a concern as well, but we try to be proactive. Chemical and biological threats are always on our mind. We're not that far from New York City. So we want to make sure that we know what's going on in the city at all times because it can affect us here in Dutchess County. 
What is the number one threat or hazard to Dutchess County as a whole? Take a guess. What, okay, let me, let me phrase it like this. What is the single event that can affect more people or has affected more people in Dutchess County than any other event? <laughs> With the exception of Myers Corners Road. <laughs> Flooding. Flooding is the number one threat in Dutchess County, okay? We need to be aware of that. Not only is it the number one threat in Dutchess County, it's the number one threat in New York State, okay? And this is not getting any better, all right? Here in Dutchess County, we've been lucky not to have been having any major catastrophic impacts uh, in recent years, but look across the country of what's been happening, right? It is uh, happening every uh, week, it seems like. There's another flooding issue. Number two, sustained power outages, three days or more. And this is Dutchess County as a whole. So uh, folks that live in the outskirts, uh, we had an issue in Amenia with a mobile home park of 300 people that was out of power for about uh, a week last year. And that was not good because that 300 person mobile home park was made up of a lot of senior citizens and a lot of individuals that didn't have cars. Uh, it, was, it was a challenge, but we, uh, we were able to get them back up and running as soon as possible. Severe wind event or tornado. And now this list, by the way, is uh, created based on historical data and statistical analysis. So you're seeing things that have occurred. Severe wind event or tornado. This was actually created before the macro burst we had last year. Major transportation accident is on the list. That's something that could occur here, all right? Something that statistically could occur in Dutchess County that uh, based on our analysis could occur uh, and uh, we're prepared for is a uh, tour bus or a, uh, a motor coach type accident involving a significant number of people. And this is based on statistics, this could happen. If one of those gets on the Taconic State Parkway, uh, mistakenly, that could be a real problem. Hazmat release in transit, that can be anything, that can be an oil truck leaking, that can be, a, uh, you know, as we talked about, a chlorine issue on a train. Hurricane, severe winter storm or ice storm, when is it the worst impact on a severe winter storm? Snowstorm when there's leaves on trees, right? Snow leaf, 1987, I think it was. What happens when the snow falls on leaves on trees? The trees fall on power lines, right? Trees come down. I remember one day, uh, one evening, uh, a number of years ago, walking outside after we had snow and hearing all the trees cracking, right? That is, that's a little creepy. <laughs> you don't want to be standing outside too long. Active shooter comes up on this list not because it's a statistical uh, occurrence, a statistically likely occurrence. The reason why it comes up on this list is when we sit down and we do this comprehensive preparedness assessment, one just happened every time we do this. So it's at the front of our minds, right? Statistically, you have a better chance of being shot in your workplace by uh, a, a, you know, workplace violence than an active shooter come walking in, okay? So active shooters, we have to keep in mind, we see it on the news on a regular basis, it's an ongoing epidemic, but statistically, it is a very low potential of occurrence, but we still have to be prepared for it. We don't want people to be uh, uh, sitting in fear at all times, but just understand that we need to be prepared. Cyber attack comes up on the list because it's, a, it's an issue that uh, is increasing, uh, especially with local governments. If you saw the 60 Minutes presentation a few weeks ago or a couple months ago, uh, you know, these ransom attacks are happening all across the country, and some of these municipalities are paying the ransom because they just can't afford to, uh, um, you, you know, close down to get things fixed. So cyber attacks on the list as well. In 2017, I talked about this. We had those major hurricanes that impacted the United States, Maria, Irma, and Harvey. Unprecedented amount of damage. Uh, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars that occurred in one year. We also had the uh, wildfires that happened uh, in California, the flooding, the landslides. That was an epic year. What part of the country was not affected? Us. Us. So why, why, is, why is that important? Because it, we will be affected by, uh, by something at some point. Just because we weren't affected that year doesn't mean we're not going to be affected by something. So what we want you to understand here is uh, you must be prepared to help yourself in a disaster. That's why we're talking about this. And the base of this pyramid, which we like to call the disaster assistance pyramid, is you and your family. You're the first line of defense. You are your own first responder, right? Your immediate neighbors. We want you to know your neighbors, right? 
Wave at your neighbors. Don't not wave. <laughs> There's this one woman in my neighborhood. I drive by, I don't know, every day I wave. She doesn't wave back. Come on. I'm, I'm starting to think maybe she doesn't see me. I, I don't know. But I'm, maybe I'm just hoping she doesn't see me. I don't know. She doesn't wave. Get to know your neighbors because you may need them to help you or they may need you to help them. Your community as a whole. When we talk about community, we talk about organizations, right? We talk about those that are involved in fraternal organizations like the Knights of Columbus or the Elks Club or uh, the American Legion or, uh, you know, uh, those types of organizations or faith-based organizations. Research has shown that those that are involved in those types of organizations or any organization in your community, you're more resilient because you have a network. You have people that you know that can help you and you can help them, right? Local government is your basic first responders, right? Your fire, police, EMS, your town. But as you'll notice, the pyramid's getting smaller as it, as it, goes, as it goes, right? You're gonna call 911, you're gonna get your fire department, you're gonna get your police, you're gonna get your ambulance. But on a day where we're being impacted as a town, it may take a little longer. I'm from the county government. We offer even less resources. However, we have access to more resources. When the town needs assistance, or the, fire, the local fire department needs assistance, they're gonna request assistance from the county. The county has limited resources to assist as well. When the county needs assistance, we're gonna request assistance from the state, right? The state is gonna be able to provide us with additional assistance. When I say assistance, uh, this can be anything from sheltering assistance to you know uh, supplies, uh, pumps to help pump out uh, basements and things like that. There are stockpiles located around New York State that we have access to uh, during emergencies. And the state uh, provides uh, a number of those uh, resources. When the state needs assistance, the state's going to request assistance from the federal government, right? FEMA. FEMA is not a first responder, right? When Puerto Rico was impacted, when New Orleans was impacted, everyone said, where's FEMA? They should be here. Well, the truth is that your local first responders, your county and your state need to be there first. There need to be plans in place at the local level to handle these types of incidents before FEMA is requested. FEMA is going to come generally after it's a presidentially declared disaster, right? But the everyday situation that begins to escalate needs to be handled at the local level first. In New York State, we are a home rule state. All disasters start locally and end locally, right? So the fire chief is still in charge, right? Or the police chief is still in charge at the local level, even though there's assistance coming from, potentially from FEMA. And that's something that we train for here in Dutchess County and throughout the state. We want uh, you to understand the role and responsibility of government in a disaster and plan with your family and know your neighbors, right? We talk about planning. There's a number of different plans that we want you to be able to, uh, to focus on. The family communications plan, right? Do you talk to your family members? You should communicate with your family members so that they understand that if something happens and we can't get back to the house, where are we gonna go, right? A basic conversation like that. Now, I know that a lot of the millennials don't talk anymore, they just text, so maybe you should text the millennials and tell them that there's a plan in place. <laughs> <laughs> How about this? Here's an idea. Keep a written log of phone numbers. So if your phone dies, you actually know how to reach someone. Or if your phone falls in the water and it is inaccessible and you can't get to the cloud, have a written list of numbers. There's an idea. Know how to get information from community resources, right? Understand that there are resources out there and that's why you folks are here tonight. Know how your child's school communicates. Know how they impart information. A lot of the schools have school messenger. They have a system set up so that if something's happening at the school, you know what's going on. If there's an emergency at a school, sometimes it's not the best idea to go to the school, right? I talk to a lot of school districts that have plans in place where the reunification point is at a different school. For example, Evans Elementary School, they have a reunification location at Wappingers Junior High School and vice versa. They're right next to each other. So we don't need all the parents showing up at Evans if the kids are going to be over at the junior high, right? So you want to understand how that works. 
text messages, social media, radio messages, understand how the communication key, uh, key messages work. Write down your plan and give it to your family members. Know who will do what, where, and with whom, right? Communicate. So if you have a situation at your home or a situation in your neighborhood where you can't get back to your home, you have a plan B. You have another location you can go to. Include your extended family. Include your child's school lockdown policy. If your child's school goes into lockdown, you're not going to be able to go pick them up, right? Understand how that works. Know what your employer will do. Be familiar with your employer's emergency plans. Keep important numbers and documents together. These are important things to have at your disposal. What if we can't communicate? If communication systems are down, how will you get your family together? If you can't send out a group text to your family or you can't get a hold of them, do you have a plan in place where you know already that if we can't reach each other, we're going to go to a designated location? Landlines down, cell phones down or overwhelmed, power outages, inability to charge cell phones or mobile devices, internet down. These are all communication barriers that could occur. Have backup forms of communication and make sure you share that plan with your family. Sometimes you may need to let a third party know what's going on. For example, if you have a relative that lives in town and you can get a hold of them but can't get a hold of your family members, make sure your family member knows ahead of time to call this person, call, call you know, Aunt Jackie or whatever, to get information, or Grandma, you know. Remember that family members may become separated, so you need to have a plan in place. Landlines and or cell phones may not work. Cell phones can become overloaded, right? Uh, I know it's a long time ago now, but on 9-11, cell phones became overloaded, right? Now we have text messaging. If the cell phones are not allowing you to make a phone call, you still may be able to make a text message or do a text message. You can try. It may work. If that doesn't work, you may need to use a messenger, like a Facebook messenger or a different uh, platform in order to communicate. Text messages still may go through. Consider what you may have to do to overcome these issues ahead of time. Have that conversation ahead of time, right? Have a plan to meet. Here's three simple steps. Decide where to meet in the event of an emergency. Three locations. First location should be your home. Second location should be a nearby relative or a friend's home. Have that pre-designated. Know that ahead of time. Third location should be out of the immediate area. So if for whatever reason your home is inaccessible, your second location is inaccessible, you've already had the conversation about a third location, right? Practice and review. And most importantly, have the conversation. Know uh, what your plan is ahead of time. Shelter in place planning. Here it is. Emergency alert. Severe weather. Shelter in place. Stay indoors. Do not venture out. I don't know if that's what it says nowadays, but how many people in this room have had their cell phone make a weird noise you never heard before and you look down and it was an Amber Alert, right? Or it vibrated in a different way, right? That's a different platform. That's the wireless emergency alert platform. It's a totally different platform that's supposed to be used for emergencies only. There's a couple different locations, a couple different entities that can access that platform. The Amber Alerts are accessed by the police aid. State police can issue those, right? Uh, but the National Weather Service can issue only two types of weather alerts on that platform. Those two types of weather alerts include tornado warning and flash flood warning. Those are the only two weather emergencies that will be issued on that platform. Why is that? They're imminently life-threatening. So if you're receiving an amber alert or if you're receiving a tornado warning, or if you're receiving a flash flood warning, you are in a geographic area that is potentially going to be impacted by that issue, right? The Amber Alert, and it's not perfect. The Amber Alerts are supposed to be going out for just the immediate area um, on that platform. I know we had a couple last year that were uh, sent out for, I don't know, Manhattan or something came across. It was just coded wrong. Uh, I'm just happy that we haven't sent out a ballistic missile crisis yet because that, that's what happened in Hawaii. That's the same system, right? We have that system in Dutchess County. We are very careful how we test it, okay? Um, they sent out a landslide warning in Central Park last year by accident. <laughs> <laughs> National Weather Service, Long Island. Um, 
The ballistic <coughs> missile one was in Hawaii. We have not had that happen in Dutchess County itself. The National Weather Service, like I said, will send out only those two types of weather emergencies because they are imminently life-threatening. You're not going to get the severe thunderstorm warning because we get one every day in August at 4 o'clock because that's just the humidity, right? So you're not going to get that. You're not going to get the uh, blizzard warning. You're not going to get the severe winter storm warning. You're not going to get any of those, all right? You're only going to get a tornado warning, and you're only going to get the flash flood warning. Tornado warning, seek shelter immediately, right? Don't go outside with your phone to take a video. You want to go inside your house to an interior room at the lowest level. Close the doors, right? If you're getting a flash flood warning and you are near a waterway and you're in a low-lying area, you need to go to higher ground, all right? Uh, and anyone that saw the video of, uh, I don't know where it was, in Tennessee or something last year, where it was like the warning went out and a minute later the whole street was covered in water and it was just coming. We don't see that happening here in Dutchess County. It's not necessarily something that uh, we've seen before. But if you do get that flash flood warning, just be aware that there's a reason why you're receiving it. In some circumstances, it's safer to stay put than to leave, right? The trend right now in emergency management is not to evacuate people unless we absolutely have to, all right? It doesn't make sense to try to evacuate people unless we have to. Shelter in place is basically what we're focused on, all right? Unless that area is going to be impacted in a negative way. So it may be safer to stay put than to leave. You may, may require creating a barrier between yourself and the outdoor threat. Now, can you give me an example of one reason why you may need to, when I say barrier, we'll start with this. Shut your windows, turn your air conditioner off. Why would we ever ask you to do that? Nope, if, you, if there was a hazardous materials release in your area, if there was a, a, a like they had in Orange County, they had a, a factory on fire that had hazardous materials in it. People that were downwind were told to close their windows, right? You don't want to breathe that stuff, all right? Bring your, bring your pets inside. Don't go outside. Don't breathe it, right? Uh, we may ask you to do that. Seal the room as if you have a real solid problem outside where, uh, uh, you know, a chemical release, right? Uh, they may uh, uh, suggest using uh, duct tape to seal, seal a room. This is something that uh, we haven't ever had to do before, but just be aware that uh, if you need to seal up your house, that's something that may be asked of you. Use common sense. Like I said, bring family pets inside, lock doors, close windows, vents, fireplace dampers, turn off all fans, air conditioning, forced hair units, go into interior room, few no windows, seal windows, doors with plastic and duct tape if necessary. This is if we have a major hazardous materials release outside in front of your house. What they say is be prepared to remain in your home for five to seven days. Realistically speaking, that's probably not going to happen, but they say be prepared for that. Keep non-perishable food items, emergency water, safety supplies. Maintain your home in working order. Know some basic skills to keep your home functioning. Understand how your, how your uh, home works. Listen for instructions from local authorities, and we'll tell you how you can do that in a few. Evacuation. Like I said, I'm going to say it again. Uh, we're not going to evacuate anyone unless we absolutely have to, okay? Evacuations occur hundreds of times each year. Evacuations can occur with very little or no time to repair. Some notable evacuations that have occurred recently are the wildfires in the last couple of weeks. And if you've been watching the Weather Channel, which is on in my office all day, I mean, it's like today, these fires are wind-driven fires. These are moving so fast that by the time the evacuation order is given, you may not even be able to get out of there. Last year or the year before, tragically, people got killed in their cars trying to leave because the roads get so, uh, so gridlocked. So you need to be aware of what's going on around you. Don't wait to be told to leave. If common sense is telling you that you shouldn't be there, get out of there. Not that we're going to have a wildfire. That's not something that's going to happen here in Dutchess County, but uh, just be aware of that. It could happen in other areas. We, we did have a big fire up on top of um, uh, Fishkill Ridge a few weeks ago, and it just burned and burned and burned and burned, <laughs> but there was no threat to any houses or anything like that up there. And fire, that, they basically surround that fire. They, they cut a line around it, and they just let it go until, until it's done. Uh, <clears throat> 
Evacuations can occur with very little or no time to prepare. Have a plan for where you and your family will meet with members leaving from home, work, school, or other locations. So if for some reason we do need to evacuate an area, again, make sure you have a plan to know where the plan B is, where you're going to go to. Have a family point of contact outside your immediate local area for family members to check in with. Same thing we talked about before. You want to make sure you have these conversations just in case your house is inaccessible or you need to leave. Flooding is the other one. If we were in an area with flash flooding, many times we'll evacuate that whole low-lying area uh, and folks need to know where to go. If you're ordered to evacuate, plan safe evacuation routes. Be familiar with the roads around here, right? Be familiar with ways how to get out of the area without using the main roads that everybody else is going to use, right? Know the local routes. Make plans for an ultimate destination once you are outside the area. Make arrangements with family. If a family member is institutionalized, that means if they're in a nursing home or, or a, a, a uh, you know, a, a, a nursing, uh, you know, skilled nursing facility or even a residence, understand how that plan works for that evacuation. In other words, all these nursing homes and long-term care facilities are required to have plans in place. Be familiar with that plan because they're going to take that person potentially that may be your relative and move them to another location. You probably want to know where that person is going to end up. Keep needed supplies and medications available. Plan for all emergencies. Make plans for evacuating your pets. So we had two tables outside, right? One is the MRC we talked about. The other is the Dutchess County Animal Response Team, DCART we call it. We have a, uh, a response team of volunteers who are animal enthusiasts, right? Many of them come from backgrounds at the SPCA. Um, some come from backgrounds in, uh, as animal control officers. Others are equine professionals. Uh, we have more horses per capita in Dutchess County than any other county in New York State with the exception of the month of July. Now, horses equal money, right? So from an economic standpoint, we need to have plans in place. DCART has their table set up out there. We're always looking for volunteers to join and get information. You have information out there, right? <coughs> Very good. We have a trailer full of equipment. Uh, we were just at the Dutchess County Fair for uh, uh, the entire uh, six-day period, staffed up with volunteers, and uh, it's a group that really is uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, building up at this point to, uh, uh, to be even more uh, uh, robust than it is. So DCART is the name of the group. You can check them out on Facebook. Plan for other needs, vehicles, home security, utilities, insurance, vital records, special needs, animals, safety skills. These are things that you should have plans for uh, as well. We'll talk about building a kit. Uh, basically, you're going to receive a kit this evening as long as you're still here, which you are. Many of the things that we're talking about here uh, at this part of the program are going to be in your kit. And we'll go through what's in your kit in a few minutes. Now, in a perfect world, you're going to have a kit for your home, for your work, and for your car, right? Different, different size kits. This is all based on FEMA ready.gov. What should you have in your home kit? This is what they recommend. You should have one gallon of water per person per day, right? And you want to plan for a uh, three to five day supply, right? If you have anyone in your household who has a medical problem, you may need more than one gallon per day per person. If you have a 109-pound German Shepherd like I do, you need to have more than one gallon per person per day, right? Don't forget about your pets. Uh, food, three to five day supply per person, that's what they recommend. Battery-powered radio, flashlight with extra batteries, first aid kit, manual. How about this? Learn first aid, right? You can go on YouTube right now and learn first aid. Everyone should know first aid because you may need to help yourself, right? Uh, first aid classes are offered throughout Dutchess County. Uh, part of the active shooter class is the Stop the Bleed class. And I will be happy to bring that here to the town of Wappinger. It's booked up pretty good for 2019, but uh, they take half the class is like talking about how to survive in an active shooter situation which is tough that we even have to talk about that, but um, the second half of the class is Stop the Bleed, where they teach you how to use tourniquets and they teach you how to stop the bleed. That's not just for active shooters, 
God forbid you have to use those skills. You come up on an auto accident or something, you may need to use those skills, right? I've been an EMT since 1996, and it's good knowledge, right? Uh, we always encourage folks to learn about uh, first aid. So instead of just a kit, learn first aid. Sanitation, hygiene supplies, matches, container, prescription medications. Don't forget your prescription medications. The big challenge now, right, with the insurance companies is how do we get extra medication, right? I'm supposed to take my blood pressure medication every single day. Um, I think I, when I'm in the one vehicle Monday through Friday, I take it because it's right there in the door. But on Saturday and Sundays, sometimes I don't take it, right? So after a month, I have some left over, right? <laughs> so you can end up with some extra medication, or you can talk to your physician about potentially getting 30 days in advance worth of medication that you can have uh, in an emergency kit. It's not easy, right? With the way the insurance companies are now, with the way the prescriptions are now, it's not an easy situation. So I would recommend you speak to your pharmacist or speak to your uh, physician about how you can uh, uh, get some additional medication if possible. Don't forget your glasses, important documents. What documents should you have in your home kit? Insurance information. What else? Birth certificate. What was the other one? Medicare card, bank statement. What else? Social Security, passport. All right, so we got ID, right? We got insurance. What else? Emergency contacts is good. How about copy of your mortgage? How about copy of you, something that proves you own that property? So that if you have to get back to that property, if it's an area that's closed off, you can prove that you have the right to get to that property. You should have that, right? One of the issues they've had in many of these disasters, they close off an area, unauthorized people enter an area, and what are they doing? Looting. Looting. Nothing ticks me off more than when Jim Cantori is doing a live stand-up on the Weather Channel and there's some guy in the background with a flat screen TV walking out of the building. Because you, know you know it's not his TV. But you always see that in the background at these disasters. And it, you know, the police can't be everywhere. But uh, understand that when you want to get back to your property, you're going to need to prove that it's your property. So we recommend that you have copies of all those things. I would not say originals in your kit, okay? I would say copies of, uh, of these things. Also in a kit, they say have a whistle, right? Why would they say have a whistle? If you become incapacitated and need to get someone's attention, this is like the old Boy Scout uh, list here, right? Have a whistle. Extra clothing, small manual kitchen tools, wrench or pliers, they talk about wrenches and pliers for shutting off gas and water. We don't get into that, but I would recommend that you learn how to do that just in case you have to turn off your gas or your water, all right? Cash coins. How much cash should you have? There's no right answer. I always like to ask. How much cash should you have on hand? $200, Who said $1,000? <laughs> She's got some money. <laughs> $1,000, okay, if you want to give me some, we'll spread it out right here. You can't do that. Okay, here it is, ladies and gentlemen, anything that you put in your kit, you cannot take out of your kit and use and say, oh, you'll put it back, because you won't. So some people say 500 bucks, some people say 100 bucks. I never heard 1,000. Most importantly, let's, not, let's make sure it's not all Benjamins, okay? You want to make sure you break it down into different denominations so that you can spend it uh, more easily, right? Because the ATM may not work. The point of sale, the chip may not work, right? So you wanna have some cash and maybe some coins uh, so that you can, uh, you can buy what you need. Now, what was the hurricane that just came up? Well, missed Florida. Dorian, last month, I was in Florida, okay? Uh, I think I'm the only emergency manager that went on vacation to an area where there was a hurricane that was expected to, uh, to arrive. Luckily, it missed Florida. But what I can tell you is I was in Key West when it started coming, right? We left Key West and we went up the West Coast to Marco Island, right, and headed towards Naples to stay on that side of the state, right? Um, even though that hurricane had not even impacted the state of Florida, what do you think was happening even on the west side of Florida? They started running out of gas, gas station lines. People were in a panic, taking money out of the ATMs, 
This is the kind of thing that's happening in Florida where they get these hurricanes on a regular basis. So just understand that if we're going to be threatened with a major storm here in the town of Wappinger, we need to be prepared ahead of time because people get into panic mode, right? And it was not fun uh, trying to get gas when they were only giving out like five gallons at a time and you had to pay in cash. It was craziness. People panic here when there's like a snowstorm. Bread and milk. Bread and milk. <laughs> Got to get the bread and milk. Yeah. And you know why? Why do people panic? Why? Because the media is hyping these things up, okay? And don't get me wrong, right? Um, I work in radio before I go to the county, right? I understand that there is a duty to uh, convey information, but we have to be responsible, right? We can't put people into a panic. We need to make sure that people understand that, okay, listen, now's the time you're going to want to go to the store, not tomorrow, right? And, uh, but people, uh, people are so busy, especially in this area, uh, uh, they're, they're not prepared. We need to be more prepared for these types of things. So it was not fun trying to get gas. I had a guy at, at the gas station. It was the craziest thing. He was shaking his car trying to put more gas in it. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> Apparently back in the 70s, that was a thing, I guess. They used to shake their cars when they went during the gas shortage. I don't know. Never seen it before. Don't want to ever see it again. Uh, I will tell you that, but when we got to Disney World after Dorian had passed, there was nobody there. So that was cool. Uh, in SeaWorld, nobody was there. So... Uh, it was like uh, uh, all to ourselves, which was good. Uh, for the millennials that are here, there are these big paper things called maps that actually show you uh, where things are. <laughs> uh, GPS may not work, you know, maps. Learn how to read a map, okay? Sorry. I'm not looking at anybody specific. All right. Uh, special items for infant or children. Make sure you don't forget about your children. Pet care items also you should have in your kit as well. Additional items to consider, mess kits, disposable flatware, plates, feminine hygiene items, pet care again, sturdy shoes. Make sure you have some sturdy shoes, right? Sleeping bags, fire extinguisher. These are all things you can add. In a perfect world, you'll have a big Rubbermaid tub like that, right? Put everything you need in there. Put it in an area that no one's going to be borrowing anything out of, right? Don't try sneaking in the kit to take a couple 20s out, you know. Oh, I'll pay it back. No, you won't. So don't steal anything out of your kit. Leave it separate, all right? For your car or work kits, which are similar to what we're going to be uh, giving you this evening, they're more portable, right? One to three days of items, food, water, emergency blanket, flashlight, light stick, first aid kit, hygiene. Keep a spare pair of sturdy shoes at work, right? During the tragic day of 9-11, we saw folks that were evacuating New York City wearing high heels, flip-flops, all these kinds of things, right? They had to do what they had to do, right? But ideally, if you had a... a a uh, sturdy pair of shoes in the workplace, you throw them on, and it'll be easier to manage. So before we get into the last section, since you folks have been paying such close attention, we're going to show you what you're going to receive this evening. <coughs> so in your kit, we're on TV here, so I'm going to make sure they can hear me. In your kit, you're going to receive an emergency blanket like we talked about, okay? You're also going to receive an emergency poncho, right? Some of these items can have multiple uses. An emergency poncho can be used as an emergency water collection device, right? You're also going to receive a whistle, okay? You're going to have some cheap gloves here to keep your hands clean. And you're going to receive one of these right here. Who knows what this is? We're, excuse me. <laughs> you just ruined my joke. <laughs> usually what I say is, after everyone says it's a, you know, a HEPA mask or a dust mask, usually I say, we're talking about emergencies and crisis here, folks. It can also be used as a coffee filter. <laughs> but since she's attended 20 of these things, she knew, she knew, ruined it for me. Also, you're going to receive aqua tabs, which are water purification tablets that you can use, right? If you have water, a water source, you can make it drinkable using these aqua tabs. There's instructions on how to do it right here. It's not that difficult. You're going to receive that as well. You're going to receive a transistor style radio, which is good. They work. Uh, the only thing is, I don't know if I would trust the, uh, where are they? The Power Max Specials here. I don't know if I would trust these. 
You may want to get a fresh set of batteries for this uh, because you know what's going to happen. If you put the old dollar store Power Max ones in here, when you take it out there in an emergency, it may not work, right? Door cell or energizer is going to be the most solid ones. You're going to get some tissues. You're going to receive a pump uh, style flashlight that you can pump like this so it works. You don't need to have uh, any sort of battery power or anything like that. It's You just pump it and it works. That actually brings me over to this. I uh, went on Amazon and bought one of these solar crank radios with flashlight and reading lamp. Oh, very nice. Um, <laughs> Amazon has these types of things, they're like 20 bucks or whatever. You can charge your cell phone with it. You could charge your cell phone with this if you want to sit there all day and crank it, right? Like this. Hold on, I'll text you back in a second. <laughs> right? Mom, can you, can you crank this while I text my friends? Um, it also has a weather band radio in here, which is good. You can listen to the weather, um, which you can, um, you can do here as well. This has an LED flashlight, reading lamp. Uh, I, I wouldn't do that to you. Uh, charge, charge cell phone, USB charger. Wow, okay, all right. Uh, you can recharge this with the hand crank or solar. There's a little solar thing on here. It's got an emergency alarm, and uh, it's got rechargeable batteries. It's pretty cool. You can buy these things on Amazon. If you really want to get into prepper mode, you can go to moreprepared.com. Moreprepared.com is like the prepper website. Uh, we actually buy these kits from More Prepared. You'll have a tag on it that says More Prepared. I'm not endorsing any specific products or websites. Uh, this is just my opinion and not the opinion of Dutchess County or the town of Wabinger. You can check out uh, that website for some interesting ideas on uh, what to, what to uh, purchase if you want. There you go. What else are you going to get? You're going to get a uh, light stick. You're going to get a 37 piece first aid kit, right? But you really want to learn first aid. If that's not enough, you're going to get some emergency purified drinking water. This is good till June of 2023, right? And then last but not least, you're going to get some uh, nice food rations here for you. I believe this is lemon flavor. I don't know. We have not tried this yet. One of the classes, I'm going to open this up. We're going to try it. But uh, here's some food rations for you. So each of you is going to receive one of these bags. Now, what else would you put in this? Shortwave radio. Shortwave radio is one. We got, some ha we got some ham radio operators here out there, too, that can communicate. Can Medications. Can opener, matches. What else? Shelter. What's that? Shelter. Shelter. Yeah, you could put some sort of a tarp for a shelter. What else? Knife. Knife would be good. Uh, fire starter. Duct tape. Duct tape. What was that? Paracord. Paracord? Parachute cord, yeah. Sure. You could put whatever you want in it. You could. You could do that. You could do that. So the idea here is we give you a preparedness starter kit, right? So you can add to this, and that's the idea. So. That's what you're going to receive as you walk out this evening through the door. They're going to hand you one, all right? And that guarantees that you're going to have a smile on your face when you drive home, right? <laughs> <laughs> so as we come into home stretch here, how do we stay informed? This is important. We mentioned some of this already. Remember the emergency alert system, which is the old emergency broadcast system, Saturday morning cartoons, you hear beep, this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. That still exists, right? It exists on your television. It exists on your Traditional radio, FM, AM, right? It's still utilized. Now, what I can tell you is that the other night during the tornado in Dallas, they did not initiate the emergency alert system because it's a voluntary system for the broadcasters. It's not mandatory. Now, if you're driving down the road listening to your favorite radio station and all of a sudden you hear the song cut out and an emergency alert system message come across, has anyone ever heard that? We're in the middle of the song. Do you know what that means? That means that the radio station you're listening to does not have a live person there. That means that it's automated, it's syndicated, and the computer automatically receives the emergency alert system and plays it, right? My radio station, there's a person there 24 hours a day. When the emergency alert system comes in, the song ends, they initiate the emergency alert system indicator, and it goes out um, manually, right? 
The reason why my radio station has to do it that way is because I work for WSPK, K104, in the morning. WHUD, which is our sister station, is an Indian Point notifier. So they have to have somebody in the building at all times in case something happens in Indian Point. So there's always somebody in the building to manage the emergency alert systems from that radio group. WPDH is the other one in this area. On the overnights, they don't have someone there, so it automatically trips over. And on other stations in this area, um, every other station in this area is automated at some point of the day. So my point here is the emergency alert system may not trip or it may trip. It's not 100 percent, all right? And it is voluntary. So uh, it's not 100% uh, dependable. The National Weather Radio, you can buy National uh, NOAA Weather Radio. You can buy those on Amazon. Basically, you can set it up for Dutchess County, right? And you can have it make an alert sound if there's any sort of alert in Dutchess County. That lasted two nights in my house. <laughs> I now have a one-year-old, um, but my wife... Uh, uh, once it went off uh, in the middle of the night for something that was, uh, I don't know, it was like a, uh, it, I don't remember, it was, it was nothing major, but it, it goes off for every alert. So, the National, I know what it was. The National Weather Service decided that they were going to initiate a winter storm warning at 2 a.m. for the next day. That's what it was, right? <laughs> and I don't know why they decided to do that, but it, it, it made the alert go off on all these radios at 2 o'clock in the morning to tell us that effective 8 a.m., there will, be a, uh, there will be a winter storm warning in effect. So anyway, I don't have that. If something, if something major is going to impact Dutchess County, the 911 center is going to call my house now. That's the way it's going to be because I need to stay married. Uh, so <laughs> plus my child needs to sleep. So it is what it is. They can also notify me on my pager, which they can put off. They set off tones that will make my pager go off. That will wake me up too. Uh, we have you know, redundancies in communication, but uh, the weather radio is just not going to happen. Uh, Department of Homeland Security, that is the system we talked about. It's called iPause, the wireless emergency alert system, uh, where really, in my opinion, this is the way we're going to be communicating with you. We're going to be communicating directly to your cell phone, wireless emergency alerts. If I need to communicate to you that there's something imminent happening in your neck of the woods, it's going to be on that system. Back in the day, we could do reverse 911 calls, right? We could call your houses and say, hey, there's something going on. The problem is less than 20% of you have landlines now. We can't reverse call cell phones. We have to do the wireless emergency alert system uh, notification. So that's what we do now from that perspective. Other um, options for you, New York Alert. New York Alert you can sign up for, nyalert.gov. Uh, basically, New York Alert is a system that the state runs that we have access to that basically you can sign up for what you want to be notified for, right? You could sign up for road closures. They'll tell you that there's a... Uh, uh, eastbound closure on Interstate 84 in Dutchess County. The Taconic State Parkway road closure for the next couple hours. Um, you can sign up for weather emergencies. They'll tell you that there's a, you know, whenever there's a, uh, the same thing the National Weather Service would tell you, they will tell you. You can sign up for sewer discharges. Apparently there's a, an option to do that because I get all the sewer discharges. Basically that means that when uh, the sewer plants become uh, diluted with water, uh, there's a requirement that the sewer plant has to notify the DEC and then you can actually sign up for that on New York Alert. Don't ask. It's on there. But don't swim in the Hudson River after a rainstorm. That's all I'll tell you. <laughs> Go ahead. So for the Homeland Security, that's wherever you are. It's the cell tower that finds you. Right? Yeah, so that's the other thing. Good point. Right, it'll be where you are. So if there's an issue, like I was driving across country, uh, we went out to Chicago and I was getting notifications as we, as we drove in those geographic areas for different things that were going on. You can set it up for that as well. But ultimately, what we need to remember is it's still not perfect, right? So if I need to notify this part of the town of Wappinger that there is a, um, uh, you know, remember when the prisoners got out and were, uh, were running, they needed people to shelter in place? Um, you're going to be drawing a polygon around an area that you want to notify, and that polygon is going to basically take the cell sites that are in that area, and it's going to push that message out over the cell site, right? Those cell sites may actually transmit outside that area. As a result of that, we have a, a consortium of emergency managers for all the counties in the Hudson Valley that whenever we're going to send out a notification, we make sure we notify them in case our message or their message bleeds into our county or vice versa. So that's something we could do, but it's, it's really dependent on the cell site location. 
My biggest issue is the areas that don't have cell service. If I have something going on, uh, a tornado is coming across you know, an area in East Clinton where there's no cell service, people may not know that's happening because there's no cell service. That's a problem. That's why we have redundant ways of communicating here. New York Alert, uh, we talked about Dutchess County Emergency Management on social media. You should follow us on uh, Facebook. On a blue sky day like today, we're gonna be sharing, uh, we're gonna be sharing training opportunities and things like that that are happening. Uh, on a uh, day in which we're affected by a, an emergency, we're going to be passing out uh, information, passing on information that deals with that emergency. We're also on Twitter at Duchess Alerts. So the idea now is that we have to notify the public on not just one platform, but several platforms. So the emergency alert system will notify on certain television channels and radios, right? The weather radio will go off if it's a weather issue. Your phone will be notified uh, with a wireless emergency alert, depending on what the issue is. New York Alert's gonna notify you, and we're gonna have it on social media as well. So one of those platforms, most people are gonna be paying attention to in some way, shape, or form. That's the only way we can effectively notify people. We expect to, in 2020, uh, be announcing a Dutchess County emergency management app. We're in the final stages of um, creating it with our vendor. Uh, we're waiting to find out if they want to brand it a certain name. Uh, the county executive uh, uh, is very involved in this, you know, something like Ready Duchess or Duchess Prepare or something like that, where you would go onto your Google Play Store or your uh, App Store, download it, uh, and you would have it on your phone, and that would be another mechanism that we can push information out to Duchess County residents. In addition to that, there'll be training opportunities. There'll be access and functional need uh, registry on there for those that have special needs. There'll be a bunch of different other options, but it'll be a Dutchess County app that brings all these uh, elements into one location because there's so many different uh, uh, options now. So as we uh, conclude here this evening, the takeaway is that you may not be with your family when a disaster strikes, right? We want you to make your plans today. Identify your point of contact. Know how you will communicate. Don't forget about your pets, right? Make sure all family members know your plan. Communicate, 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 right? Strengthen your preparedness. The fact that you came here this evening, like I said, you're already more prepared than most just by being here. <laughs> Learn basic skills. We talked about learning first aid, right? CPR, it's good knowledge. Get involved in your community. The Medical Reserve Corps, the Dutchess County Animal Response Team, they both have tables set up out there. Feel free to grab some information. You can also provide your information to them. Actually, just uh, if they're interested in uh, more information about DCART, just have them sign up with MRC and indicate DCART for uh, we can contact them. Um, know your surroundings. Plan for your pets again. Know the resources outside your community as well, as we talked about here this evening. The Dutchess County Executive's Office uh, and the Department of Emergency Response are the primary sponsors of this program. The Dutchess County Executive uh, wants me to mention his name three times. I think I did it twice so far, right? County Executive Molinero. Uh, DutchessNY.gov is our website, the brand new Dutchess County website. Check it out. While you're checking out websites, you got to check out our brand new town website. Right, Joey? That's right. Townofwappingerny.gov. Is that correct? Uh, town of Wappinger, NY.gov is our new Town of Wappinger website. Uh, a lot of time and effort went into that. The Cornell Cooperative Extension is our agriculture partner. We talked about that. Our state partners are there. But most importantly, folks, uh, everything we talked about is at ready.gov. Ready.gov. Prepare, plan, stay informed. You are your own first responder until assistance may arrive. Be prepared. Do you have any questions? Depends on where you're located. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, folks that are in the room right now, you all live in the town or different areas? How many from Fishkill. Fishkill? Okay, so let me tell you this. Fishkill has a very proactive emergency preparedness committee, okay? The Fishkill Town Hall and the Fishkill Rec Center are locations that have been utilized uh, for uh, meeting up with family and friends during issues. Most recently during the macro burst, we used the town hall here and the Fishkill Town Hall. So your town halls generally will be good hubs for that type of uh, location as well. Sure. Uh, shelters come up during these discussions too. We have a number of pre-designated shelters in Dutchess County. We don't publish a shelter list because they're not all open, okay? 
Until we open a shelter, we're not going to publish locations because we don't want people going uh, to one of these locations. For example, the Mid-Hudson Civic Center is a shelter for Poughkeepsie, right? It's pre-designated. We have a contract in place, but we don't announce it as a shelter until it's actually open. We utilize uh, different schools, like we could use Wapiters Junior High School, we could use Ketchum High School. These are all uh, shelters that have been surveyed by the American Red Cross and are listed as potential shelters. We don't announce them until they are actually open and staffed. So that is something that we get a lot of questions about. Where's my shelter? It depends on what the magnitude of the incident is for us to uh, decide which shelters to open, right? So those are the common questions. If you have anything additional, I will be right up here. Otherwise, I appreciate your time. I appreciate the fact that you're coming uh, out on an evening like this, on a beautiful fall evening, to learn about preparedness. And uh, it was my pleasure uh, being here this evening. Thank you. You can pick up your kits on the way out. Our MRC volunteers will uh, help you out as you uh, make your way out the door. Thank you. <laughs>